Hello everyone. So today I wanted to do a book review on trauma and recovery, the aftermath of violence from domestic abuse to political terror. And this is by Judith Herman, MD. And of course I will pop up the cover so that you can take a look at that if you would like to order it. And I think that this is a very important book from a psychological angle and in fact on the front of the book, sorry for that long dramatic pause, it says one of the most important psychiatric works to be published since Freud and I actually agree with that. And this is about trauma and recovery, obviously hence the title. But I think sometimes uh, when things happen, people don't necessarily see a clear path from the event to moving forward, being able to recover, and other people, when something traumatic happens to a loved one, don't understand the psychology of what is going on with their mind, with their body, how they shut down, how that affects them. And I just think this is an important book to take a look at the whole picture of how trauma affects people and how they can recover from it. So with that being said, I am just going to dive right in. Again, this is Trauma and Recovery, The Aftermath of Violence from Domestic Abuse to Political Terror, and it is by Judith Herman, MD. Okay, so the ordinary response to atrocities is to banish them from consciousness. These atrocities, however, refuse to be buried, and thus the conflict between the will to deny horrible events and the will to proclaim them aloud is the central dialectic of psychological trauma. The psychological distress symptoms of traumatized people call attention to the experience of an unspeakable secret and deflect attention from it. This is apparent in the way traumatized people alternate between feeling numb and reliving the event. Trauma can give rise to alterations of consciousness, most commonly disassociation. So why this book? People who have endured horrific events suffer predictable psychological harm. Established diagnostic concepts, especially the severe personality disorders commonly diagnosed in women, have generally failed to recognize the impact of victimization. The first part of the book delineates the spectrum of human adaption to traumatic events, and the second half speaks on the recovery process. To study psychological trauma is to come face to face with both human vulnerability and human capability for evil. It means bearing witness to horrible events. When the events are acts of God, those who bear witness sympathize readily with the victim. But when the traumatic events are of a human design, those who bear witness are caught in the conflict between victim and perpetrator. It is morally impossible to remain neutral in this conflict. The bystander is forced to take sides. It is very tempting to take the side of the perpetrator. All the perpetrator asks is that the bystander do nothing. This appeals to the universal desire to see no evil, speak no evil. The victim, however, asks the bystander to share the burden of pain. It was once believed that traumatic events were uncommon. In 1980, when PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder was first included in the diagnostic manual, the American Psychiatric Association described traumatic events as outside the range of usual human experience. Rape and domestic violence are so common a part of women's lives that they can hardly be described as outside the range of ordinary experience. Military trauma too 
must be considered a common part of human experience in view of the number of people killed in war over the past century. I would also like to add the number of people who have been severely wounded by war in the past century. Traumatic events are extraordinary because they overwhelm the ordinary human adaptions to life and generally involve threats to life or bodily integrity. The common denominator of psychological terror is a feeling of intense fear, helplessness, loss of control, and threat of annihilation. The ordinary human response to danger is a complex, integrated system of reactions encompassing both body and mind. Threat initially arouses the sympathetic nervous system, causing of the person in danger to feel an adrenaline rush and go into a state of alert. Threat also concentrates a person's attention on the immediate situation. These changes in arousal, attention, emotion, and perception are normal adaptive reactions. Traumatic reactions occur when action is of no avail, when neither resistance nor escape is possible. The human system of self-defense becomes overwhelmed and disorganized. Each component of the ordinary response to danger tends to persist in an altered and exaggerated state long after the actual danger is over. After a traumatic event has occurred, the human system of self-preservation seems to go on to permanent alert as if the danger might return at any moment. In this state of hyperarousal, which is the first cardinal symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder, the traumatized person startles easily, reacts irritably to small provocations, and sleeps poorly. What can also happen when a person is completely powerless and resistance is futile is go into a state of surrender. The self-defense system shuts down entirely. The helpless person escapes from the situation not by action, but by altering their state of consciousness. These alterations of consciousness are at the heart of constriction or numbing. The third cardinal symptom of post-traumatic stress disorder. These detached states are similar to a hypnotic trance. Traumatic events call into question basic human relationships. They shatter the construction, excuse me, of the self that is formed and sustained in relation to others. They undermine the belief systems that give meaning to human experience. They violate the victim's faith in a natural or divine order and cast the victim into a state of existential crisis. <clears throat> Traumatized people feel utterly alone, utterly abandoned, and cast out of the human and divine systems of care and protection that sustain life. Thereafter, a sense of alienation, of disconnection, pervades every relationship from the most intimate familial bonds to the most abstract affiliations of community and religion. When trust is lost, traumatized people feel that they belong more to the dead than to the living. When the body is invaded, injured, or defiled, the trauma violates the person at the level of basic bodily integrity. Developmental conflicts, long since resolved, are suddenly reopened. Trauma forces the survivor to relive earlier struggles over autonomy, initiative, competence, identity, and intimacy. The damage to the survivor's faith and sense of community is particularly severe when the traumatic event involves the betrayal of important relationships. So moving on, the, this book also deals specifically or has a chapter specifically related to child abuse. Repeated trauma in adult life erodes the structure of the personality already formed, but repeated trauma in childhood forms and deforms the personality. The child trapped in an abusive environment is faced with formidable tasks of adaptation. 
They must find a way to preserve a sense of trust in people who are untrustworthy, safety in a situation that is unsafe, control in a situation that is terrifyingly unpredictable, power in a situation of helplessness, unable to care or, for, or protect themselves. They must compensate for the failures of adult care and protection with the only means at their disposal, an immature system of psychological defenses. The pathological environment of childhood abuse forces the development of extraordinary capacities, both creative and destructive. It fosters the development of abnormal states of consciousness in which the ordinary relations of body and mind, reality and imagination, knowledge and memory no longer hold. These altered states of consciousness permit the elaboration of a prodigious array of symptoms, both somatic and psychological. These symptoms simultaneously conceal and reveal their origins. They speak in disguised languages of secrets too terrible for words. Honestly, just thinking about childhood abuse and so many people suffer from that is just hard and heavy on my heart. However, this book also talks about recovery because as humans we do have endurance and we have hope and we are in charge of our own destiny. And so we can recover, we have resilience, and we can move forward from traumatic experiences. The core experiences of psychological trauma are disempowerment and disconnection from others. Recovery, therefore, is based upon the empowerment of the survivor and the creation of new connections. Recovery can take place only within the context of relationships. It cannot occur in isolation. In their renewed connections with other people, the survivor recreates the psychological faculties that were damaged or deformed by the, tra <clears throat> the traumatic excuse me, experience. These faculties include the basic capacities for trust, autonomy, initiative, competence, identity, and intimacy. Just as these capabilities are originally formed in relationships with other people, they must be reformed in such relationships. The first principle of recovery is the empowerment of the survivor. They must be the author and arbiter of their own recovery. Others may offer advice, support, assistance, affection, and care, but not cure. Many ben benevolent and well-intentioned attempts to assist the survivor founder because this fundamental principle of empowerment is not observed. No intervention that takes power away from the survivor can possibly foster their recovery, no matter how much it appears to be in their immediate best interest. In the words of an incest survivor, good therapists were those who really validated my experience and helped me to control my behavior rather than trying to control me. Recovery unfolds in three stages. The central task of the first stage is the establishment of safety. Trauma robs victims of a sense of power and control. The guiding principle of recovery is to restore power and control to the survivor. No therapeutic work can succeed if safety has not been established. Survivors feel unsafe in their bodies. Their emotions and their thinking feel out of control. They can also feel unsafe in relation to other people. The strategies of therapy must address the patient's safety concerns in all of these domains. These include the use of medication to reduce reactivity and hyperarousal and the use of behavioral techniques such as relaxation and hard exercise to manage stress. The confusion of the disorder can be addressed with cognitive and behavioral strategies. 
These include the recognition and naming of symptoms, the use of daily logs to chart symptoms and adaptive responses, the definition of manageable homework tasks, and the development of concrete safety plans. The destruction of attachment that occurs with the disorder must be addressed by interpersonal strategies. These include the gradual development of a trusting relationship in psychotherapy. Finally, the social alienation of the disorder must be addressed through social strategies. These include mobilizing the survivor's natural support systems, such as family, lovers, friends, introducing the survivor to voluntary self-help organizations, and often as a last resort, calling upon the formal institutions of mental health, social welfare, and justice. Establishing safety begins by focusing on control of the body and gradually moves outward towards control of the environment. Issues of bodily integrity include attention to basic health needs, regulation of bodily functions such as sleep, eating, exercise, management of post-traumatic symptoms, and control of self-destructive behaviors. In the second stage of recovery, remembrance and mourning, the survivor tells the story of the trauma. The basic principle of empowerment continues to apply during this stage. The choice to confront the horrors of the past rests with the survivor. The therapist plays the role of a witness and ally in whose presence the survivor can speak of the unspeakable. The reconstruction of trauma places great demands on the courage of both the patient and the therapist. It requires that both be clear in their purpose and secure in their alliance. Freud provides an eloquent description of the patient's approach to uncovering work in psychotherapy. The patient must find the courage to direct their attention to the phenomena of their illness. The illness must no longer seem to them contemptible, but must become an enemy worthy of their mettle a piece of their personality which has solid ground for its existence and out of which things of value for their future life have to be derived. The way is thus paved for a reconciliation with the repressed material which is coming to expression in their symptoms while at the same time place is found for a certain tolerance for the state of being ill. So having come to terms with the traumatic past, the third step is reconnection. The survivor faces the task of creating a future. They have mourned the fact that trauma destroyed the old self. Now they must develop a new self. Relationships have been tested and forever changed by the trauma. Now they must develop new relationships. The old beliefs that gave meaning to their life have been challenged. Now they must find a new a sustaining faith. These are the tasks of the third stage of recovery. In accomplishing this work, the survivor reclaims their world. The final chapter, which is chapter 11, is on commonality. Traumatic events destroy the sustaining bonds between individual and community. Those who have survived learn that their sense of self, of worth, of humanity depends upon a feeling of connection to others. The solidarity of a group provides the strongest protection against terror and despair and the strongest antidote to traumatic experience. Trauma isolates. The group recreates a sense of belonging. Trauma shames and stigmatizes. The group bears witness and affirms. Trauma degrades the victim. The group exalts them. Trauma dehumanizes the victim. The group restores their humanity. Oh, I just got chills actually reading that because I do believe in that. In case you couldn't tell, the commonality was a, regarding group therapy and the book talks about three different kinds of therapy and ways to connect with others and I do think that is very important when you have gone through a traumatic event to know that you are not alone. 
I think it is very helpful to know in this world that we all have struggles and while they may be unique to us in our family, in our community, they are not unique to others in the world and we can draw support and we can draw strength from those who have been through the ringer, so to speak, and have survived. I highly recommend this book by Judith Herman. It is Trauma and Recovery. And I think if we have not experienced trauma in our own lives, I think this book is worth reading because we all know someone, unfortunately, who has experienced a traumatic event in their life. And instead of getting frustrated or confused and wondering why they are behaving the way they are behaving or getting frustrated and confused and wondering how you can help them through something and not knowing how to help because you love them, because you care about them and you want to see them get better. This book is an excellent resource for explaining what is occurring in someone's mental state, the effects of trauma on the mind, on the body, and excellent steps on how to start healing and to start recovering from trauma, including very basic issues of safety and that the person who has been through trauma has to feel safe at the very minimum before any recovery work can be done. And I do believe that that is something not a lot of people understand if they have not experienced personal trauma themselves. So that is it for this book review. If you have read this book and you think I left an important part out, please let me know in the comments below. Also let me know if you have any questions. And that is it until the next video. As always, thanks for watching and I will see you next time.